She deserves it. I want you to make it right. Do what you do. Holy crap on a cracker. Do what you do, Deborah said. All of Dexter's life, from when he was a little kid until now, some, some deep, dark part of him wanted Deborah to not only know what he was, but also understand why he does what he does and maybe even approve. We all want to belong, right? I mean, even Dexter. And here's Deb asking Dexter to kill someone his way, to find justice in this world to the death of a killer who, who got away with murder. Dexter, any other time, Dexter would find such validation in those words from his sister. Ultimately, you know, he didn't even find that from his father who trained him. The, the bad news is, is Deb wants Dexter to kill Hannah, the girl he really likes right now, and who, by the way, is laying in his arms in some sort of like post, post-coital, you know, cuddling thing. I didn't, I didn't know serial killers did that, but I guess they do. Dexter does. He's found such peace with Hannah in a way that no other woman has ever given him. She doesn't even want to dive head first into Dexter's dark urges. She actually doesn't even care. It's just a fact of Dexter's life. She likes Dexter, just him. She doesn't want anything more from him. It's acceptance. They need to belong. That's, that's completely answered in Hannah. And Deb wants Dexter to kill her. Poor Dexter. Hey, welcome to the Ra- Dexter Wrap-Up Podcast for episode 707, Chemistry. It's written by Karen Campbell and Manny Cotto, directed by Holly Dale. I'm your host, Scott Reynolds, uh, a writer-producer Dexter, but on the show since season one, I was a writing assistant, working my way up. And I love this thing. And I, now I get to do this whole podcast thing too? Life is good. So here's what's in store for you. Let's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the episode, then go to Louis Chiaffi's uh, editing bay and talk in depth about what he did as the editor of this episode. You're going to want to go back and watch it again after he drops his editing knowledge on your heads. He's smart. He's got a lot of interesting things to say about what, uh, what you watched during the episode. And after that, we're going to go back in time and answer your questions about episode 706, Do the Wrong Thing. And we're going to have Lauren Gussis the writer of the episode here, along with executive producer Scott Buck here. They're going to answer all your questions. Anyway, let's talk about this episode, chemistry. There's a lot going on in this episode, whether it's, whether it's between, there's a lot of chemistry going on, I mean, in this episode, whether it's between Dexter and Hannah, Nadia and Quinn, Deborah and Sal Price, it's there, it's all there. It's, you know, it's even there in the concoction that Hannah puts together to end the life of Sal. That's funny, right? It's like, it's everywhere. It's, it's all sorts of chemistry going on. So let's start, with, uh, let's start with Dexter and Hannah. At the top of the episode, which uh, you know, Lewis is going to break down for you brilliantly during the interview section, Hannah takes back the knife, puts it to Dexter's neck, and then proceeds to have sex with him again. In the snow, on Dexter's kill table. Let's be real here. All that plastic, I bet that got really sweaty. I hope he threw it away. I, you know, I, we should have written that he threw it away. He probably threw it away. And from there... Both Dexter and Hannah, uh, they decide that there is not a world in which it's a good idea that two people like them continue to have a relationship, especially, you know, once Sal Price sees Dexter dropping off Hannah early in the morning. That only means one thing. Dexter may have fudged the kill spree evidence because Dexter is dating her, which means, you know, in any other movie, Hannah is the femme fatale. I mean, this is this chick's like straight out of Maltese Falcon, you know, who wouldn't want to read a book about this chick Sal Price is thinking? And, you know, the convoluted stuff with Dexter, this is, this is everything he's wanted and more. Here's the thing, though. Dexter can't stay away from Hannah. And the truth is, Hannah doesn't mind. He, ke- he keeps finding reasons to visit her, culminating in his need to tell her about Sal Price and his continued pursuit of Hannah, and more importantly, to Dexter himself. So, so Dexter breaks into Sal's place, gets some evidence to, you know, to, to plant in a murder crime scene that could implicate Sal in a murder he didn't commit. You know, he steals the toothbrush, takes some, uh, some hair, some bloody, ugh, some bloody dental floss. He's got some bad gums, that guy. I, I knew it from the start that Sal Price had bad gums. Anyway, uh, he grabs all the stuff to go put into a crime, you know, to put into a, uh, uh, a murder that this guy didn't commit. He normally doesn't get, go out of his way for anybody other than himself and Deb, so it's kind of a big deal that he's doing this for Hannah. And Hannah, being Hannah, she's not the type of chick to let others do for her what she can do for herself, so... So she poisons Sal with, I don't know, literally a poisoned pen, the one he chews on all the time. And unfortunately for Dexter, this guy dies in Dexter's apartment. Ugh, you know. But, but 
Honestly, how funny is the thud of Sal's head on that <laughs> Dexter's coffee table? At least I think it's funny. Uh, or, you know, or maybe I've been working on the show too long. Any, anyway, it's funny. Come on, it's funny. Anyway, all this leads Dexter back to Hannah to chastise her for screwing up his life. But instead, his other passions take over and Dexter ends up back in bed with Hannah. So let's talk about Deborah. Well, yeah, that leads us to Deborah realizing that Hannah is, you know, most likely poisoned her new love interest, Sal, or let's say like interest, Sal Price. The guy had bad gums, which puts Deborah in the vendetta state of mind that we talked about earlier. Let's talk a minute about that, about how, how we got Deborah from the person we saw in previous seasons, someone who lived a, a completely black and white life, to the person who, I don't know, like her father, tells Dexter that there are some people who deserve to die, just like her dad said. At one point, when breaking the season, we were going to have this happen in episode 705. And then we realized we were making a mistake, and that was much too quick. So, so we had uh, Deborah meet up with Speltzer, who is uh, you know, the, the, the Minotaur man, a horrible, sadistic killer who killed someone after going free. This brought Deborah to realize you know, that there is a place for Dexter in this world. Though, as she said, she didn't understand why Dexter needed to have his blood slide mementos, his, his trophies. It's a little sick, she thought, that Speltzer had the same sort of thing with his, the earrings that he ripped off the girl's left ear. Uh, which, as you guys saw you know, in the previous episode, Dexter let this blood slides go. He's changing in small ways, too. Then, back to Deborah. Deborah meets Hannah, and Hannah's gotten away with a lot of murder. However, Deborah chastises Dexter when she realizes that Dexter kept the truth about the Wayne Randall murders away from her. Remember that scene? That, that Hannah was one of the killers, not just someone who watched it all go down. She... She thought, and she thought that Dexter lied to Deb so he could put Hannah on his table, which isn't untrue. I just don't think she would expect it to go down the way that uh, they did, it did go down. I should stop saying that. Then she tried to prove that Hannah's first husband was murdered, even gave his, his sister hope that Hannah would go to jail and, uh, and her brother's death vindicated, but that went nowhere. The chemistry they, they were looking for in the, in the body of Hannah's first husband the husband wasn't there. There's no poison found. But the final piece of the puzzle, it was Sal. And Deborah realized that for now, there's only one way to end Hannah's murderous ways, through her brother. It's a tragic turn of events that will reverberate throughout the rest of the season. It's not quite the same as like, you know, Charles Bronson as Kersey and Death Wish, but it's a bit more convoluted, but frankly, so is Deb. And during all this love business, Deborah successfully manages to convince LaGuerta that this, this Bay Harbor Butcher case is her own version of, of chasing after windmills or waterfalls. I would, I, anyway, uh, this is due to LaGuerta's own confused feelings, her chemistry, if you will, with, with Dokes, which allows Deborah to breathe a little sigh of, sigh of relief. At least she won't have to continue lying to LaGuerta, something for which we learn she thinks she's going to hell for, which is funny. Meanwhile, uh, Isaac walks free, thanks to Quinn taking the only piece of evidence that linked Isaac to the Colombian bar murders. Now here's, you know, we needed this brief reprieve from Isaac's pursuit of Dexter to sort of firm up this relationship between Hannah and Dexter. After all, you know, it, it would be uh, pushing the bounds of credulity uh, that Dexter would find time to see Hannah when he's got this Isaac, this murderous gang boss, out and about ready to take him down. We also needed to get this guy back on track as soon as possible. But Isaac m finds it hard to get to Dexter when his every move is under the scrutiny of Miami Metro Police, thanks to Deborah. And then when Deborah sends her team to the bar to try to find new evidence, you know, the blood evidence uh, that the Isaac's blood in the place, to find, they find that this case has literally gone to crap. I mean, there's feces everywhere. Ah, the glamorous life of Miami Metro homicide. By the way, I gotta say, wasn't that look on George's face uh, priceless when he realized, this is sort of back when he was picking up Isaac from jail, when he realized that Isaac wasn't gonna get on an airplane and head back to the Ukraine. Instead, he was going to continue his rabid pursuit of Dexter, a member of the police, which is just nuts. Jason Gedrick is great there. Speaking of Gedrick as George, wasn't he just the, I don't know, just the, the, the bitch of a human being when he didn't follow through on his promise to Quinn to give Nadia back her passport and thus her freedom? I tell you, Quinn just keeps digging himself deeper and deeper into the quagmire of the Koshka Brotherhood. I don't know how it's going to go down. I mean, I know how it's going to go down, but I'm saying that to, like, to be like, oh, what's going to happen? Also of note, how about that scene where, where Hannah tells what really happened between Wayne and the couple they killed? She said she stabbed her until the screaming stopped. Yvonne found that that, that pitch-perfect note of Hannah manipulating Sal to get her, to, you know, so she'd go get a Kleenex, so, he, so, how, so Sal would get a Kleenex so that she could put some poison on his pen. All 
while seeming to really be mourning the murder of the poor wife and mourning the loss of her own life at that point. A small an Emmy for her there, maybe. Or at least, a, I don't know. And finally, can we talk about Isaac and Dexter sharing that meal? Or, or the, the chip, as they call it? Those wacky foreigners and the things they call French fries. They're the French fries. I mean, they should call them French fries because they're, they're, France is in Europe. Anyway, Dexter compares Isaac to, uh, to Wile E. Coyote. And he's not wrong, but the hunger for vengeance is different than the coyote's need for food. And it really comes to head when, when Dexter meticulously explains what he did to Victor, down to the, the bashing the fire extinguisher onto Victor's head. Gives you a glimpse into how Dexter holds on to these kills now that he doesn't have his trophy slides anymore. It was meant to bring fear to Isaac, but I don't know. Fear has no purchase in Isaac's heart, not with the loss he feels. Speaking of loss and love, you know, Dexter actually wonders at the end of this episode if this feeling he has toward Hannah is in fact love. Our little serial killer is morphing. He's changing. Into what? It's hard to say. Yeah, anyway, okay, enough of this recapness. Let's go straight to the source. The man who has edited more episodes of Dexter than any other person on the planet you could say he is the preeminent expert in making the stories we write uh, make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Louis Chiaffi. So I'm sitting here with uh, Louis Chiaffi. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in Queens or out here, you could say Oh, you're Chiaffi. from you're from Queens? Yeah. Um, if we were in Italy, it'd be Chofi, but Chofi? that's close enough. Yeah, when you're in America, we like to brutalize the name, <laughs> right? Giaffi, two yeah. Fs, <laughs> one C. Um, you're the editor of episode. You've been an, you've been an editor on the show since uh, season two. Season two. I've been and, on season two, and they haven't been able to get rid of me. I think I've done more episodes episodes of Dexter than anybody else. Than anybody on the planet. Any other editors, yeah. And then, I mean, on the planet, though. Yeah, true. probably on the planet. Uh, either uh, other editors or on the planet. That's what's awesome <laughs> yeah. about you. So let's talk about episode seven. This episode is, uh, one, seven. The one that you did. What's it called again? It's uh, This one's called Chemistry. Chemistry. Um, yeah, this ep- it, it's about... It's about Dexter and... Oh, wait, wait. Let's... Yeah. yeah. Uh, about that whole thing. So the, the, the process, the way this all sort of works, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know how the whole television thing works. They shoot for... They, we, we shoot for eight days... And as it's going along, you get, you get the dailies. I get the dailies. We'll get like anywhere every day. Aver- yeah, if, yeah. That's what they're, they're called dailies. We'll get like two, three hours, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> anywhere. That's what they're called dailies. Hey, <laughs> hey, yo, <laughs> hey Scott, you're a moron. No, no, I mean, <laughs> no. It's okay. I got it. I'm a moron. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> now you'll get anywhere from uh, two to four hours of dailies every day. So you watch, yeah, everything. You, well, I mean, you you have to watch everything, right? Um, Depending on how much footage, I, I'll watch two cameras at a time, like the director, okay. because yeah, there's not enough time in the day to watch all. And also, um, I wind up comparing all the line readings pretty much for every every line. Because you get you, you get notes from the set too, right? That yeah, say yeah, you'll I get, like this uh, this I like this part. You get that sort of yeah. You don't direction. usually get a lot of specific notes from the directors. Like okay. on this one, um, you know, I got a note from the director. Uh, for the very opening of the show, uh, she wanted to maybe use the, the tilt. This fantastic Holly Dale. Tilt. Was Holly director, Dale, right. um, she's fantastic. Um, she did a great job of, of tilting down from the, in the beginning, which right. was a different kind of an opening than was scripted, and it re- worked really well. And ultimately, we didn't go with that one. But yeah, I'll get a note from the script supervisor, somebody who sits Scott uh, Peterson, Scott Peterson, and he'll sit with. He'll sit next to the director and he'll do what's called the line script, which is okay. for every setup. Excuse me. Every every time the camera's moved someplace, it's called a setup. And we always shoot with two cameras on Dexter, sometimes three. And uh, Scott will line the script as to, you know, this coverage goes. It's called coverage when you shoot a take. And uh, he'll kind of line the script and give me a general idea of where things would go. Yeah. Um, usually it's pretty obvious though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I do. And the scripts are pretty specific too. Yeah. Yeah, it'll say we. You know, yeah, they're very Follow specific. Dexter as he. Yeah, 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 as he goes and. Yeah. Makes love. <laughs> <laughs> like at the top of this episode. Yeah. So you get all these dailies, then you assemble your cut. Yeah. Then I I, I put a cut together, and you know when when I put a cut together, it's uh, I've got music in it, sound yeah. effects. It looks like the show by the time um I deliver it to the director. Usually yeah. the directors. Um, have some input, but it's not a ton because they only have four days. It, yeah. It's not like 
I can give them something that's, you know, this a basket case, really. It's, it's got to look like the show pretty right. much when it gets to them. Right, right, right. You're sure the guide... Cause, cause yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've done like you know, I've done a ton of these. I know, I know how the show should look. Yeah, you know how the producers want it to look. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I kind of, I at this point, I kind of do know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, episode, so, so now we're caught up. So episode seven, you've assembled this thing together, and yeah, people and, are giving notes and changing. Yeah, and, as I, you know, adjust. we sent it off to uh, Hollydale. Um, I showed it to her. She gave me actually two of her days. Because she said, just take your time and make oh, it the way you think it should look, which is fantastic and very generous of her. Uh, she had some notes. I addressed those. And two days after that, I sent it off to our producers, uh, right. Scott Buck, Sarah Collinton, yeah. and John Goldwyn, and our writers, uh, Karen Campbell and Manny Cotto. Yeah. And uh, I got notes from them. Yeah. And I think you know the, the biggest note I had on this episode from the writers was... Start over. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> just hit delete mark in and out hit delete and just what's wrong with you no um it was mostly um i had questions about i i guess i played dexter and hannah more like uh like they were in love right from the get-go so sort of a, it, ro a romance it was more thing. of a yeah and and really and and also maybe some of the more of the, I, I saw her more as like Bonnie from Bonnie and Clyde rather right. than Catherine Trammell from Basic Instinct, which I think who she is in this episode anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's a big question for the for the audience and everybody to to wonder what is Hannah McKay. Yeah, I well I still have no. How much idea. trouble is Dexter in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I still have no idea, um, really exactly who she is. Yeah, I have a pretty good idea. But in, when I was putting this together, I had yeah, I really didn't know. We cover a lot of ground this season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you know this episode. The most important thing is is actually Deb. Um, one of the most right. important things. And, it's got that killer ending. You know what? You know where her character goes by the end of it. Yeah, you know, it's pretty. I I can't believe. This we went there at this point in the season. I thought this that, that would be the season finale. Right, right. By episode seven, we have Deb saying, "Go Kill. ahead, <laughs> do do what you do best." Yeah, which Kill. has been Dexter's like dream his whole life to get this sort of acceptance from his sister. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's with yeah. Hannah, who he's sleeping with <laughs> yeah, a every, lot. <laughs> yeah, yet he does. He does have it. What about thirty seconds of peace and love? You know, he's he does. And he's just so happy at the end of the episode, and then you know he gets the phone call. You know, please yeah. kill my. Love kill your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you wanted to talk about? I know you you were uh, you were wanting to talk about the the uh, the opening of chemistry. This because um, at the end of uh, was it at the at the end of last episode, Dexter brings her brings her in to see some snow. Brings Hannah to see some snow. Yeah, she thinks, oh my gosh, this is the greatest guy ever. And then he sticks a needle in her neck. Right, M ninety nines her, lays her out on a table. She wakes up. He's confused, but he's going to kill her. And instead, he cuts her loose, and they, they it, make love. Yeah, and uh, we pick up with the the aftermath. Yeah, of that, and it's Dexter and Hannah lying next to each other, laying next, he's laying a lot, long, whatever one of those next to each lying. other on the table, and uh, you know he's questioning what he's doing there, what, right. what is going on, and uh, the two actors are fantastic in the scene, um, fearless, both of them. Yeah, absolutely amazing. fearless. They, I mean. Uh, they look they look great and they're completely in sync in the scene and the way I could kind of tell that one of the, the a trick I used in the scene editing it is their breathing. What do you mean? Well, like one would breathe in and the other would breathe out. It wow. was they were completely in sync with one another. I could play the scene without music and you would hear it's as she, they're exhaling on a line delivery, the other one's inhaling. And it kind of just... That's right. It's a very breathy scene. You're right. Now that I'm thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. It's one, it's one of my favorite scenes of, I've ever done on the, on the, on the show, just because it, it just kind of welds them together yeah. the two, as they become one. It's, it's a pretty effective scene. Do you want to? You want to play what it's? How, what do you think would be the best to hear? Would it be best to hear it without the music? Or yeah, do you let's hear it? let's hear it without music. Let me see if I can make that happen here. I think you can. On I the avid, you. you do. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess I could play. Let's try here. Oh, you want to hear it with the music and then take it out, or I don't know. 
chemistry. Let's hear it. We're going to hear it with with no music. An attraction that can't be quantified or explained. Is that the reason behind this loss of control? Maybe the desire to get Hannah on my table was just a way to deny the effect she has on me. So now what? That's the breathing. <laughs> Just for the viewers at home. Yeah. You can't view it. He just brought a knife up to her neck. To his neck. Not much. You do this to all the girls you go out with? Wrap them up in plastic? I don't actually go out. So then what? This whole date thing was just a way to get me alone so you could kill me? Shut the music off. It's a general discretion. You have no idea. And they're they're, they're back right, together. Yeah, they're, they're, but it, it, I mean, using the breathing just really helps the two of them yeah. just kind of make that connection with each other. So you said the music then started to sync up with the breathing. Is that what you were saying? Well, no, uh, no more. No. It's just more there. It's like the it's rhythm just, of the yeah. The, the, the music does sync up with them, but. Um, it's a few different pieces of music that we're yeah. using in here from Dan. Uh, Dan, Dan like our composer. Yeah, yeah. this is uh, actually a lot of this music is from uh, season, some of it's from season one, uh, some of it's from season seven. Yeah, he even walked us through like the, there's like the Hannah theme now that started to come up a little bit. Yeah, this yeah. is, uh, this is, these are the pieces that comprise the Hannah theme. He yeah. came up with some, some new cool stuff. So what, what uh, is there another, another moment that, that you feel like, uh... well, let's see. The, oh, there's this uh, this scene with uh, Hannah and Sal Price where we actually see her. She starts to cry. She starts to cry. And it is that's what's that's what's so amazing about uh, Hannah and what you've done with her, piecing her together. Is you're never sure if it's real or if it's fake or if it's a mix of both. If she even knows. Yeah, I don't. She's one of the, the she's because you had I had the ball on this scene. It's not like the Hitchcock thing where you see the you see the you see the pen. He goes to the nap. He goes to get the tissue, and then you see her, you know, swap out the pen and with the poison on the end of it. Yeah, you know, you kind of you kind of don't see you don't see it coming at all. Don't you don't really it. see it coming at all. There's a bit of there's a piece of music that kind of lets you know something may have happened that's a little bit out of the ordinary. Um, but she, I, I believe her in this scene. Yeah, I me believe too. she's. This is the truth. Yeah. But she also is just being who she really is. It's we, the heart of the tragedy of of Hannah that that this one she she talked about that previously about how this one uh, kill when she was 15 years old shaded every shaded her whole life afterwards. Like everything spiraled out of control, and she's just trying to put everything back in the box and control it and live a life and not surrender and. Pretty amazing. Yeah, she's. I figured it'd be easy seeing as how scared she was. What was Wayne doing? He started to stab the husband over and over and over. The woman was screaming like crazy. The man she loved was getting knifed in front of her eyes. This is Dan likes a uh, Hannah. Yeah. Right. He, he, the theme. he grabbed Wayne and he pulled him toward him and and then the woman jumped on How do you Wayne make the decision to go party. from yeah, she was just protecting Cuz Dexter's a different kind of show. I don't blame yeah. Her. When it, when when you when you got two people I talking. The same thing. Yeah. How do you make the decision to go from one person to the next? When to list when to watch someone listen? You know, it depends on it all depends on the character Wayne and where they are for me to in get the her story. Um her by the hair and I this is bed. This, you know this scene's about Sal she Price just, she's he's got he's been screaming. looking for this interview for 10 years he's but right. um so the actor is I so compelling her. here 
You and just what, stay on her at this point. I could stay on her. You could just watch her for all day. So right. And we pretty much do stay on her. You do. Yeah. Um, this whole scene. And she only, she didn't, I think we had two takes with two cameras. Wow. And that both of them, it. yeah, that's it. She I just nailed it. It's, until the screaming stopped. Um, she just nailed it. <laughs> and then and poor then Sal Price gets his tissues and a poison pen. Yep. He's ca- <laughs> caring <laughs> for her was his, his biggest flaw. <laughs> what if it's a sign of things to come? I don't yeah. know. Maybe. <laughs> and the little piano, you know, that ding, 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 uh, that, yeah. that, that means he's been poisoned. That's great. Um, so let's talk about uh, scenes with Dexter. What's what's interesting when I watch scenes that you put together with Dexter, um, a lot a lot of times we just watch Dexter. Yeah, it's a different. Sh- it, most shows aren't that way at all. Like most times, it's uh, I'm talking, and then the camera's on Lewis, and Lewis is talking, and then Scott is talking, and then Lewis is talking. And yeah, the, you know the, the thing about Dexter is it, it's about Dexter pretty right. much, and um, you always kind of have to be tracking what he's doing in a scene because you know. Dexter isn't really one person. He's the one person who, he's one person who uh, presents himself to the world. Right. The facade he puts up, but then there's also the real Dexter, who is doing something completely different, has a completely different agenda than everybody else in a given scene. Um, right. right. So he's at least. And the, he shows us that on his face sometimes. He, all <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could see it, it's. You could see he's looking around, and, and well, sometimes you hear the voiceover, but not too much. He gives it to you without any, any kind of narration. How many people is, is Dexter? Is it two, three? Yeah. Four, four. maybe? Yeah. You know, he's, 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 he's the killer. He's the, he's the dad. He's the brother. He's the cop. Yeah. And then he, I don't even think he knows what he is. with this unreliable narrator that he's got going on. Yeah. Telling us <laughs> what isn't necessarily true sometimes. Yeah. You know? I don't feel anything. Well, he yeah. does. Yeah, he does feel something. So, I mean, that's why... He, is there like a template you have, sort of? Or is just every scene's different with Dexter? Every scene is pretty much different with him. Because um, Isaac, I noticed scenes with Isaac, mm-hmm. it feels sort of even. Well, you know, you, you might want to wait, wait somebody like a character like Isaac evenly. So, so Trinity you, back in the day, too. Yeah, yeah. Trinity. Uh, just so... Because they're formidable adversaries, right? You know, they they're coming from a place. Their story is occasionally as important as Dexter's, right? Um, so yeah, they will more than likely get. They'll we'll pay more attention to them. Deb certainly, sure. Um, we do that with as well. But it is just as interesting to watch Dexter l- listen. Oh yeah, as it is to watch the other character talk sometimes. Oh my <laughs> yeah, amazing. there's there's uh, I mean there's some scenes where you know you could play. An entire speech from another actor on Dexter, and he's reacting to every single beat. I mean, he always does it. So you can, I mean, yeah, he's it's it's pretty amazing. He's active. Yeah, he's always active, like nobody I've ever seen. <laughs> and then you've been nominated how many times? Uh, a couple of uh, AC Eddies. I won one of them uh, for episode Woo-hoo! for uh, the episode "Remains to Be Seen," episode yeah. four hundred two, and then I was nominated again uh, for "Take It," episode five hundred season five five hundred eight right. uh, for an AC Eddie and for the Emmy on that one. And then I've also been nominated for an award not many people have heard of is the uh, Hollywood Post Alliance HPA Award. What's that um, mean? Hollywood Post Alliance. It's oh. for editing. Oh, it's for editing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's for editing. There's three years in a row on that. I just got nominated for uh, the season premiere of uh, season six. Wow. So that w- that's You're the really man, cool. in other words. In other words, I'm sitting here with Louis the Man Chiaffi. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like it. From now on, we're going to put that on your T-shirt or something. <laughs> um, editor, so you've been editing for how long? Uh, you know, since I got out of college. Um, so 1957. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, 20, 23 or four years. 24 years you've been editing. Yeah, I, I went. How'd to, you get your start? Uh, at school? So did you go to school for editing? No, I went to I went to uh, St. John's in Queens. Oh, okay, and, uh, not New Jersey. Yeah, yeah well, you know, one, the only thing I really knew that I liked to do is go to the movies when I was in college. I didn't like any of my majors. I was a business major, computer science major, and then um, I liked to go to the movies. And then me too. This guy, there was a, a professor that came into one of my. I uh, took like this film production class, and a professor 
a film appreciation class and this professor from the film production class came in and he was like this really interesting guy he's throwing a uh, 16 millimeter film around to everybody he says hey huh? you can you can do this you can make movies and stuff so i signed up for his class and uh he was an editor his name's don finnamore okay and um i wound up kind of keeping in touch with him after i graduated with a computer and business you said yeah. yeah okay i was a, a business i'm actually Became a, I became a computer, uh, what do they call that? Communications major. Okay. And uh, I kind of kept in touch with him after I graduated, and he hired me um, oh, out of awesome. school. So I wound up pretty Out lucky. here or out there? Where was in he New at? York. In New York? He's in New York in the Movie Lab building. Um, and Don was, uh, he's my mentor, I guess. I worked for him for about a year and a half. And then uh, I moved into commercials in New York. I did that for another year and a half. And I kind of got tired of product shots. Right. And I always wanted to work in movies, so I moved out here. Oh, right on. Um, and so I, in New York, it was all commercials and, and features, too? or you know, you know, um, Was it like Blowout? Remember Blowout? And yeah. Doing all those little <laughs> movies at the beginning with John Travolta? Yeah, no, it, it wasn't. I mean, you kind of... Don did a lot of different things. We did the, uh, the retrospective every year for the Film Society. Okay. So we go through all these old films. Um, the first job I had was working with a photo editor from Playboy, picking stills for the Sex and the Cinema issue. Hello. Um, that was my first job. I was sat in a movie all over with this, <laughs> this really fantastic woman, Patty Baudet, and uh, we would we'd pick stills for the Sex and the Cinema issue. Uh, we also uh, we'd do the retrospectives for the Film Society. And uh, I sunk dailies for like millions of movies. Okay. You know, um, every movie that was shooting in New York, Don had a deal with his lab, and we would sync up dailies. Back then it was film, and then we'd ship them off. And after I kind of ran... I kind of learned everything I could from Don. Right. I moved into commercials okay. over there. And then uh, it was great back then. I mean, you kind of did a little bit of everything. I did sound editing. I uh, cut negative. I cut film. I learned how to cut videotape. And the Avid, the nonlinear system, started coming in just when I was leaving. Huh. So I had this huge amount of experience. You know, also, you'd you know, do all the business aspects of it. You'd fill out POs. You'd book time. You'd right. you know, talk about bills. You so could do it all. You know, you learned a little bit of everything, which was really yeah. helpful later on. You know, I would, uh, when I was 24, 25, I'd work with the agency. I'd have like five or six people in the room editing with me. So that was a lot of great experience for now right. when you're working with a room. Right. Um, so it was great. And then I moved out uh, to L.A. When I moved out to L.A. When was that? 1990. 1990. Uh, so um, one of the people I worked with in the commercial house, Sarah King, she was – working for Roger Corman. She became the post-production supervisor. I love Roger Corman. Yeah, so <laughs> um, when I, I, she was able to get me a job working for this New York editor, Eric Beeson, um, at Roger Corman. So I worked for Roger on, uh, on well, a total of five movies. I assisted on one, and I edited four. Wow. Um, That's a good thing about working for Roger Corman, right? You could... You could move up, yeah. You right could, away if you, if need be. Yeah, if if, <laughs> if yeah if if need be. Uh, I I worked for Eric. I wound up assisting Eric on a, one movie there. Then he got a bunch of movies. I think we did seven in a row. Holy I was a se- uh, as an assistant over the course of about two and a half years. And uh, one of the directors I worked with is John Dahl on The Last Seduction. Yeah. So um, and he works on this show all the time now. John works on the show all the two, time. two three episodes a season. Yeah, he did the uh, premiere. So I've known John for a long time. Huh. And uh, you know, I learned a lot working with him as an assistant and uh, as an editor later on because he, you know, he's worked with some of the best people in the business, and, and I pay attention usually to people that uh, know what they're doing. Most of the time, anyway. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I wound up working uh, for Roger. Uh, I did, what was the first thing we did? It was called uh, Force to Fight. Actually, in the beginning it was called Inside, then it became called Blood Fist Part 3 because Roger figured he could sell it for more money if it right. was Blood Fist so Part 3. three. Um, and then uh, we did that. And then, so it was uh, Blood Fist Part 3, Born? Forced to Fight. Forced to Fight. It's with Don okay. the Dragon Don Wilson. Don the Dragon Wilson. Yeah. He's a, uh, he's a small man. <laughs> no, actually, he's, <laughs> he's pretty he's big. He's shorter. No, he's, he's awesome, though. Is yeah, he? he's 6'2". He was like a real oh. karate guy. And it, when, how they'd sell his movies, it would be like, uh, you know, a Van Dam- uh, Don Wilson will kick Van Dam's ass. <laughs> it would say that on the poster. <laughs> I love Don <laughs> they the Dragon Wilson. Yeah, he was, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun working down there. And, you know, a bunch of the people that I worked with then, I'm still friends with now, and I see them. They're all over the place. Yeah. Um, and I did uh, so. I assisted on a bunch of movies after the first one for Roger, and then 
uh, Eric, the editor I was working for, he got called by a woman to uh, to edit a movie, and he wasn't available. He recommended me, and that, that was your big step. That was up my to play. yeah. It was my yeah. You know, well, it was a step up to up, <laughs> up onto the curb, <laughs> maybe. Uh, and uh, Catherine was nice enough to hire me on that first one. Catherine Siren uh, was called In the Heat of Passion. But Ooh. I actually was called unfaithful, but of course it became In the Heat of Passion Part Two <laughs> because Roger could yeah, sell for more money that way. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> I, I edited that one with Catherine. And then I did another one right after that called Captain Nuke and the Bomber Boys, which had the most amazing. I don't know that one. Yeah, that one had Joe Mantegna, Joanna Pakula, Holy smokes. Rod Steiger. What? Joe Piscopo, remember Joe? I remember Piscopo? him. I mean, yeah, yeah. He played a some, zombie cop at one for some yeah, movie too. Right? <laughs> that's right, Dead Heat. Dead Heat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was a really, it was a great cast, and uh, I, that was my second movie. And then, uh, I imagine uh, working for Corman was good prep for TV because you get what? Yeah, you get four days to, to yeah, get something together. The, no, the thing with Rogers is that as soon as he saw the director's cut you were pretty much done. There was another day of work after that because he'd have like three notes. It'd be like, trim this shot and reel four. And it was like kind of random seeming. Yeah. There was never any really story notes. It was, you know, as long as he had the pieces he needed to sell it, you know, he was fine. Yeah. So we were always worried that, what the big thing is, is you, you're really worried that you'll have to you know, do another for Roger. And if it's not good, you're probably going to have to, right? <laughs> right? So it's always like there's this gun to your head where, you know, Unless it's as good as it can possibly be in that short of amount of time, you're you're not going to go anywhere. Right. Right. So right. yeah, it is in that way. It's a, it's a great training ground for TV because it's like you're editing with a gun to your head almost. Not that <laughs> editing with a gun to you. It's not TV like, is a little bit that way. I mean, there's a there's there's a huge amount of pressure. Yeah. I mean, we have we, we get, shoot it in eight days and then you get how many days to we to get, get a director's cut? Yeah, I get you know for the editor's cut I'll get editor's cut. Yes, it's sorry. uh the last day the, on the ninth day I'll get the last day of dailies and then we'll get I'll get two more days after that to deliver a cut to the director. Okay. Then the director gets four days. Um and you're changing it like crazy during that time for the director? Yeah, we, it depends. Or maybe not. It depends uh, on on the director and how complicated the episode is. Um you know on the episode we're going to talk about today 7 yeah. Episode seven. This is maybe the. This is, I guess, the easiest episode I've had, uh, change-wise, in oh, wow. about four seasons. Because normally, I mean, let's just let's just be honest here. Yeah. Uh, you save the writers' asses. You save our asses every <laughs> week, <laughs> every episode. You. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're being you're being really nice. <laughs> the, uh, one of the great things about Dexter is the scripts are. You know, I'm a fan of the show, and when you get a you get a script. Uh, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe, A, this is happening, right? It's really exciting. It's like, wow, this is fantastic. And then you kind of get a little nervous because you actually have to execute this fantastic script. And right. you know if it's not good, it's nobody's fault probably but yours. We're kind of like the goalies <laughs> over here. Um, uh, is that, um, and there's not really that many, there's hardly ever any you know, issues. That you guys move scenes around here and there. Yeah, and, I mean, like, I, I think. But it's mostly like other, like, Tertiary characters, sort of. Right? Yeah, it's not never. I mean, you know, what, what's great about the show? I mean, you you've got some fantastic actors. The crew's unbelievable. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, you know, you could uh, honestly, you could just probably keep the camera on 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 any of our lead actors. Uh, you know, Michael C. Hall certainly. Yeah. And just just watch him because he's always doing something interesting. It's yeah. it's phenomenal. I, I mean, nobody really. I, mean, I guess maybe some people do realize, but you know, the voiceover that that Dexter has in his head nobody reads that to him on set it's just he's doing that he's in it he's yeah. just doing it and I don't know I've never seen anything like it before quite honestly yeah um, me really, neither it's, it's, it's amazing and it doesn't feel awkward it just it just always sort of works yeah no yeah. I mean no matter what situation you're in um, he is it's just there it's natural and it, it works it's fantastic anyway thanks so much thanks a lot Louis guys. Jaffe see you Scott Hey, we're sitting here with uh, Scott Buck. Hello. Hello, Scott Buck. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah. You look great. I feel great. Yeah. And we're also sitting here with uh, Lauren Gussis. I call her Gus, so you, I might say, hey, Gus. That's fine with me. Is that fine with you? That's but you great. prefer people see you on the street. Yeah. Th they call you 
Lauren. Lauren. Or Gus is okay. But that's right. awfully familiar. Yeah, it is awfully familiar. Yeah, I feel like if, if I know you well enough to hug you, you can call me Gus. That's right. Well, and the, here's the thing. Uh, uh, Gus and I have been working together for uh, a long time, nine years. Something crazy like that. Getting on there, like eight, eight seasons eight, of Dexter yeah. and then one season of... E-Ring. Yeah. Yeah. Where you were like in charge of sending men off into battle. I don't know that I was in charge of that. I think I was so <laughs> overwhelmed by having no business being on that show. You did so good. Though. It was fun. It was you told amazing. you gave Dennis Hopper words to say. It was an amazing learning opportunity for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and now you took kickboxing and you're badass and everything now. Not so much lately, but no. yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, you wrote this episode. I did. What was it called again? Do the wrong thing. Do the wrong thing. And uh, is there anyone that does that better than you? Probably not. <laughs> You're very good at that. I am. I am. How'd you become this? Uh, how'd you become a screenwriter? How'd this happen? Because uh, you're from Chicago or something. Yes, I'm yeah. from this north suburbs of Chicago, Deerfield. Um, Heard of it? Yes. Uh, I kind of always knew that I wanted to be a writer. I used to flip over my Disney books on tape, and you know when you could record your own stories and sit under the table and tell stories and stuff. And oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we still have them somewhere in my parents' house. With your little voice. Totally. It was always kind of lower, though. It was weird. <laughs> and, uh, and then Bambi yeah. went. <laughs> totally. Mitten. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. And um, I don't know. I, I didn't know what kind of writer I wanted to be. I didn't want to write books. Um, yeah, I, books. Well, no, I just, no, I just, I, it wasn't my way of yeah. being. And uh, I wrote sketch comedy in high school. Okay. And but I figured there was no money in being a playwright, and so right. when I took the PSATs, I was looking for what I wanted to do when I went to college, and there was a little circle to fill in that said TV film writer, and it jumped out at me in 3D, and I filled it in, and I never looked back. And that was it. Wow. That was it. So I don't know. I came out here. I worked high school at, mattered for you. Yeah. Mm. And I worked at an agency, and Ooh. I met a bunch of people, and right. one of them got her first staff job, um, and so she was kind enough to bring me on with her as a writer's assistant to have an ally on the staff. Oh, right on. And what so show was that? That was on Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey, like comic book stuff. Yeah. And I came out here to be a comedy writer, so that was a surprise for me. It was just the <laughs> only... you do an action. Yeah, it was the only place I could get a job. Wow. And so I met a lot of people who took me under their wing. Right. And uh, Birds? Yes. Bird people? Exactly. Okay. One of them was Melissa Rosenberg. Melissa who Rosenberg. Here. She was on Dexter. Yeah. Um, and eventually, being in enough writer's rooms, they taught me how to pitch. And eventually, somebody, Ken Biller, got the showrunner job on E-Ring, and he hired right. me as a staff writer. So. That's where we met. That's where we met. Yep, good times. And then, uh, then now on Dexter, here's an interesting thing about you, I think, and uh, t you can back me up on this, Scott Buck. We'll see. Is there, <laughs> is there anybody? Uh, theme is very important to you. That's true. As as a writer, uh, what does that mean to you in episodic television? Th theme. Why is that so important? Because um, oftentimes in the room, when we're like starting to break something, you'll be like, "Yeah, no, wait, what's the." What's the theme as you're pulling your hair out well, and stuff? The, the reason it's important to me in terms of my own process is that right. I, I don't know how to tell a story unless I can feel it um, like in my heart. I don't know how to tell it just from a plot basis. I wish I right. did. You happen to be very good at that. I wish <laughs> I had that skill. But for me, I can only tell a story if it viscerally feels emotional. And so unless I understand the emotions, and a lot of times that has to do with theme, like what it's really about, I don't right. know where to go back to. I feel like that's the place that grounds me in terms of what the story's about. So let's talk about Do the Wrong Thing then. Um, theme for you in that episode, how did you ground yourself with that? It, to me, it felt like it was about obsession. Okay. Um, and the links that we go to, and also that sometimes when we become obsessed with one thing, we think it's about one thing, and really it's about something else. Sure, Like sure. in this episode for Dexter, he thinks he's obsessed with wanting to kill Hannah because he wants to kill her, and really he's obsessed with her because he has this deep attraction to her. Right. And for me, that was really fun to play with. Right, right, right. It was fun to watch. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, look, I'm looking around the room, and people are sort of nodding a little bit. Yeah, yeah. A little. <laughs> Not too much. It's weird. No, no, it was really great. Um, biggest stumble in your writing career. Go. Uh, not getting into the creative writing program at Northwestern. Oh, look at that. Scott Buck. I didn't get into that either. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I went there, and I didn't get in. So. What's your biggest win in your writing career? I don't know. TV show or whatever. Something that great Probably that happened, that landing on six feet under. Because you were doing comedy. Because it was just a, it was just a, a strange jump, and it was this tiny little show that hadn't aired yet. Um, they had already shot the first season, but right. it, it hadn't aired, so no one knew what it was. And I watched these episodes, and they were looking for a new writer, and and somehow I got that job. I don't know how. Because <laughs> you're great. Yeah. You're a yeah. Good writer. yeah. And what about you? Landing on the show. 
having to be my second staff job ever and landing on this show. Me too. And being here for eight years. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. Yeah, I love (laughs) this place. All right, well, hey, uh, I got some questions here about the episode for you guys. Um, So I'm going to start asking them. Rachel on Facebook asks, some seasons uh, she feels that Harry is not featured more than others. Does this tell us anything about Dexter's internal conflicts? Uh, I think Harry is generally featured pretty much the same throughout the season. So, um, you maybe know, episodically, uh, maybe she's maybe episodically. It all different. depends on what Hexter, what Dexter is going through, because there's two different ways to use Harry. One is is because he- Dexter has no one else to talk to, so this is a way of accessing his thoughts, um, his emotions, and what's going through his mind. But also to help explain what he's doing at right. times. A lot of times, it's just plot stuff that we use Harry for because again there's no easy way to explain what's going on because he doesn't talk to anybody and and so, sometimes uh, there's a lack of Harry like when I think of season five and and this season also uh, there's a lot of Harry in this season but it's when he's uh, has someone else to talk with sure I mean with his... Hannah this season that gave him someone else to, to yeah have conversations he, with. He could process with a real live human being. But I feel like Harry's also a really good person to elucidate theme with. So right. for me, I you know I, I happen to really like using Harry. So. You're being you're you're being obsessed. Lots of people mm-hmm. loved uh, uh, that moment after Dexter asked Hannah out. Yeah. I mean that's I think <laughs> that may, might be my favorite uh, Harry moment of all time. Yeah. It what, was, was it, it was, what was the line? A date? <laughs> really? <laughs> He was all animated. It was great. It was so funny. People just cracked up. That was a, that was a good moment. And that, that, but that was one of those moments you're talking about where we get to elucidate Dexter's state of mind. And, right. Yeah. It's good. Uh, Colin on Facebook asks, it seems Dexter's becoming more emotional each episode. And talking about the past with, uh, and talking about the past with Deb, did he ultimately make the decision to keep Hannah alive because Deborah made him feel so guilty about Rita and Lumen? I, I don't think so. I don't know, but... <laughs> no, I think he kept <laughs> Hannah alive because he has a, this huge feelings for her. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think... Cut her I mean, free. He is becoming more emotional. He's becoming more human increasingly over the years. Yeah. And I think that he's able to make that decision because he's more human and he's able to access that in a way that he hasn't before. But right. I don't think So to a certain extent, Deb is opening that up for him. Absolutely. I just don't but think it was from a guilt place. Guilt. I think yeah. it was from a connection place and a vulnerability place. I mean, yeah. if you look at him in that scene, he actually looks really vulnerable and a little yeah. bit scary. He holds the knife to his heart, covering his heart. Yeah, and he, <laughs> he kind of lets her take the lead in some yeah. way because he's he's a little bit paralyzed with the fact that he's having these feelings come up and he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. You know, he took the action of cutting her free and then he's like, now what? And she <laughs> really takes the lead. It's kind of, yeah. it was beautiful the way yeah. he played it. It was great. It was a big surprise. People were screaming when, when they watched. No. In my house too. <laughs> it was great. Um, Tony from Facebook asks, is it me or did Sal Price have files on the ice truck killer and the Bay Harbor butcher? Yes, he did have files on that because he's a, a true crime reporter. So it's very natural that he would have looked into all of those kind of things. And not that they were connected in any way to Hannah or that he would connect him to Dexter, but that's just uh, what he does. Right, just that at some point in time, he may have considered writing about it. Yep, yep. Compiling research. That's right. Um, Caroline at Twitter asks, before the end of 706, how much of his, of Dexter's attraction to Hannah had Dexter admitted to himself? Um, I think, you know, we went back and forth about this a lot. Um, I think on some level he has to know that he's attracted to her. I mean, he's a, he's a person, but he was dismissive of it. Dismissive enough that he, you know, his attitude seemed to be, I don't care that I'm attracted to her. I'm still going to kill her. It doesn't mean she's less deserving of my table. Right. Um, you know, I think in that moment where he picks up the picture of Harrison and fixes his hair when he notices she's in the doorway, yeah. I think that's a moment where he kind of admits to himself that he's attracted to her. I think the way that, that he moment. <laughs> the way that he looks at her, I think he's aware, but I think he's consistently pushing it out of his head, thinking that it's not going to be an issue because for so long, Dexter isn't ruled by his emotions. He right. hasn't been at least. Yeah. And so he, he doesn't um, take it all that seriously. He doesn't take his emotions that seriously, but they keep sneaking up on him, particularly this season, the more he becomes more human. And then at the end of this episode, you know, she says this thing to him. She says, do what you got to do, yeah. which basically says, I see you in yeah. a way that no one's ever seen him. And he, he can't help but react to that and want to be with her, you know. But also I would say because these are new emotions for him, so they don't fully make sense to him. Right. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't know exactly what he's feeling. He's feeling an urge, and the only urge that he's really accustomed to feeling is the need to kill. So right. he tries to channel in, into that, and it's, it's just a difficult process. Right. Him. He assumes that when he's drawn to someone, that's why. Sure. Uh, Jordan at Twitter asked, in, ep- in episode six, why did Harry tell Dexter that heart disease killed him when it was really suicide? 
Well, it was, it was suicide both. by heart disease. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Harry had heart disease, and he stopped taking his medication, which is ultimately what led right. to his death. Heart disease killed him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Dexter wants to think about that, by the way. Right. That his father committed suicide. Probably That's, not. Yeah. Steve on Twitter asks, why do you use... This is sort of like a production question, I guess. Okay. Why do you use twin boys for Harrison's role? Why not just one kid? Um, as they got older, we did just start using one at a time. But when we initially brought them on, it's very helpful to you to have twins because you can only use them for a limited amount of time so that you can switch between the two. But as they get older, then there are a lot more SAG rules that start to take right. place. So, it, so, so the benefit is not as strong as they age. So twin babies. Twin babies is very You can make helpful. a living off them. One is crying. Hopefully the other is not. <laughs> Identical twins. Yeah, well, yeah, it's got to be real twins, right? <laughs> Finally, this is, uh, this is probably a question for, uh, for Gus. Roxanne on Facebook asks, does Hannah own any bras that aren't black? It's not that I noticed or anything. <laughs> this was some chick named Roxanne. I could answer who, that. <laughs> I would say no. Yeah, I would, I would say, say no. I would say those are her dark brassingers. God bless them. You always get the sex episodes. I do. I you know? do. Not, not, not on, there's not, there's no. I feel like this time was by design. First time ever. Yeah. Most times it sort of lands just kind on of you. Lands in my lap, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> lands and, on me. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, you do a good job with it. Thank you. Thank you. You write what you know. <laughs> We're all proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there it is. Thanks, guys, for coming in. Uh, the end of the seventh Dexter wrap up podcast. Time really flies when you're having fun, especially when that fun includes, you know, watching two serial killers fall for each other. And that fun includes all sorts of potential mayhem from a, a strip club owning Ukrainian mobster. Am I right? Can I get a holler? Holler! Yeah, there we go. Now, if you have some questions uh, after watching episode 707, Chemistry, you have the chance to get them answered by Scott Buck and Manny Cotto, one of the writers of that episode. And if you remember last time, Manny brought him some answers. He's, how do you say, uh, He won't shut up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he's interesting, and he directed and wrote Dr. Giggles. I love me some Dr. Giggles. Speaking of Dr. Giggles, I bet you're wondering how you get your questions answered on this podcast. Well, uh, you go to facebook.com forward slash Dexter and post up your question. Or if you're into Twittering, tweeting, then hit us up at uh, twitter.com, SHO underscore Dexter, but hashtag that question with hashtag Dexter wrap up. Do it before Monday night. That means, you know, 707 chemistry can't lollygaga in your DVR waiting for you to grace it with your presence. You watch that stuff Sunday night. Send me the questions while you watch it. We compile on Monday night, pick the best of the bunch, and we'll ask away here. I want to thank Louis Chiaffi for bringing us behind the scenes and what being an editor is all about. And let's not forget Mr. Rob Galuzzo, a.k.a. Rob G., the producer sound engineer for the podcast. A.k.a. Rob G. I'm uh, Scott Reynolds, one of the writers here on the show. You can find me on Twitter <laughs> at jscottamy. I uh, recently tweeted some behind-the-scenes pics of how we handle arguments over a uh, story in the writer's room. You guys should uh, follow me, check it out. It involved a knife, a woman, and a man. Mm -hmm. I'll tweet some other stuff. I put up the uh, Love on the Run book. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's good. Uh, I also answer questions real time during Sunday night episodes and sometimes live tweet. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of serial killer men. Catch us next week when our guest will be the director of Argentina, Romeo Tyrone. He's the guy that helped to find the look of Dexter as a cinematographer. Then he moved up to, uh, he moved up like the Jeffersons uh, to being a director of several unforgettable episodes. He pointed out some things that, um, that blew my mind. It'll make you look at Dexter in a whole new way as he, as he tells us how they shoot kill scenes, uh, they shoot kill scenes in the day-to-day -day work and home scenes very differently with Michael C. Hall. It's, it's really, really great stuff. Well, that's it. That's the end. But don't worry. It's going to happen again and again. It has to happen. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.